Good evening, everyone. I'd like to call to order the Papillion La Vista Community Schools Board of Education meeting for May 23rd, 2022. Section one call to order, item A. Please rise for the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the Republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you all. Uh, roll call, please. Mr. Lewis? Here. Mr. Bailey? Here. 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 Thank you. As noted at every meeting, we do have the open meetings law posted at the entrance of to the boardroom. Uh, that concludes section one call to order. Moving on to section two communications. Uh, item A, our recognitions for this evening. Dr. Rickley. Thank you very much, um, Mr. Lotus, members of the board. Thank you for uh, so many of our community members being here this evening. And for those that are watching on YouTube, we always love having your participation. Uh, we've come to a point on the agenda. Typically, it's one of our favorite parts of the board meeting agenda, and that is providing recognition to students and staff who have exemplified the things that the district stands for. We've got a couple of different groups that we're going to be recognizing this evening. The first uh, deals with state journalism. Second deals with state track and field. Uh, I'll pause after the state journalism award, and then we'll just have you come up front here, take a picture, and moms, dads, whomever is here, we'd love to have you come up and take pictures, and the district will take some pictures also. So under the state journalism category, we have Papillion La Vista High School, who's coached by Joe Rahacek, the voice of the Monarchs. And I didn't see Coach Joe here tonight, but uh, an outstanding coach and teacher for us. Four different individuals were recognized by the state journalism team from Papillion La Vista High School. Uh, Avery Delwich is a software sophomore who uh, won in the area of newspaper feature writing. Allison Pluard, who is a junior photo artistic illustration. Anthony Rubeck Sr. won twice for newspaper sports feature writing and broadcast public service announcement. And finally, Jackson Vetter Sr. in the area of broadcast public service announcement who won as a team. Now, I would also like to recognize Papillion La Vista South, who was coached by Ann Albrecht. I didn't see Ann come in either. Um, Salim Ayer, who's a, a senior at South, uh, one in the area of sports action photography, but Salim was not able to make it this evening. However, I do believe we have a few of our monarchs in attendance this evening. Would you please come down and be recognized by your Board of Education? Outstanding. Well done, Monarchs. We are very proud of you. In the second category, state track and field, uh, we had two winners from Papillion La Vista South. Uh, did I see Coach walk in? Uh, Coach, how are you doing? Thanks for being here. Coach uh, McLaughlin. Uh, I didn't see Jared Johansson, but uh, Coach McLaughlin, we appreciate you representing the, uh, the Titan Nation here this evening. Two individuals who won at the state track meet, which was recently wrapped up. We had Maria Kimson, who's a senior, who won in girls pole vault, set a new Class A event record at 12 foot 6. That's incredible. And then the second winner was Caden Frederick, who's a junior, who won in boys' discus. And I'm told both of these winners, both Maria and Caden, not only won in Class A, but I believe they took the all-class medal, which means regardless of classification size of school district uh, that they won. Maria and Caden, please come on down and be recognized by your Board of Education. Yeah. 
be a coach up here. So congratulations to our Titans, Coach McLaughlin. Thanks again for being here. Uh, terrific accomplishments. A great way to wrap up uh, the uh, sports season for both high schools. And with that, Mr. Lotus, I would conclude my recognitions for the evening. Thank you, Dr. Rickley. All right, moving on to item B under Section 2 Communications, our uh, military advisory report uh, for this meeting. Uh, welcome up uh, Colonel, Colonel Cooley. Welcome, Colonel. Uh, thank you, ladies and gentlemen. It's a pleasure to be back up here. Uh, always appreciate the opportunity to speak and the partnership that we have uh, with uh, Papillion La Vista. Uh, just some basic uh, base updates. Uh, 20 July, we'll have Operation Backpack, which is a great opportunity for our military kids, affiliated kids to receive uh, school supplies and some other fun stuff that uh, 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 based on last year, is a very popular event, and uh, uh, I know that a lot of the kids will, get, will enjoy that thoroughly. Also, on the 3rd of June, having uh, uh, the base picnic, uh, we'll be at the Berry Farm, uh, sponsored by uh, OAC, uh, uh, Office Advisory Council, uh, who's always provided wonderful support for the base. Uh, we're also entering change of command season. The 557th Weather Wing uh, changes command tomorrow, and then we will also have the uh, 55th Maintenance Group, Ops Group, and uh, uh, Comm Group will all uh, change out this summer. Uh, so a very busy time of year, but uh, uh, Colonel Thompson, the wing commander, and uh, uh, Colonel Howard, the vice wing commander, will not change out, uh, nor will I this summer. Uh, demolition and construction from uh, flood repair continues. Uh, demolition uh, is ongoing, uh, approaching complete, uh, but uh, a lot of fill work to, uh, uh, to, to bring the, uh, that end of base back up above uh, the, the uh, uh, 500 floodplain. So uh, around 60,000 dump truck loads are going to be brought in to build up uh, the area. So uh, massive uh, earthworks going in. Uh, and demolition out at the base lake uh, has just started. Uh, we expect the first, uh, we're calling them campuses, uh, to be uh, complete uh, this time next year. Uh, but th this is going to be still a long process out through uh, 2025 at least. Uh, also, with the uh, runway repair and uh, uh, move back, we're still uh, all signs point to a September move. Uh, so we will be closing down the Lincoln operation uh, late September, uh, and we'll have a phased process to bring uh, all the equipment that we've had over there for uh, it'll be well over uh, well, approaching two years. So uh, major uh, movement to get all the, that equipment back, and then of course the uh, the jets uh, will be a, a fairly big event for the base. We expect to have some air. Uh, distinguished visitors come in to uh, uh, really welcome and, and uh, uh, inaugurate this, this new runway. So paving is still going very well thanks to a, a mild winter, and our, our, our contractors have been doing a really good job of, uh, of course, quality and then, of course, uh, keeping us on timeline. I'll be happy to field any questions uh, from the panel here. Colonel, we mm -hmm. always appreciate your reports and uh, appreciate all that you do to support not only the base, the wing, and the community, but uh, just have to tell you, we, we really enjoyed uh, hearing from Colonel Thompson at the last meeting. I yeah. had the opportunity to meet her before, but uh, I heard universally uh, it was really great to hear from the boss. Absolutely. She's an incredibly impressive officer, an incredibly <laughs> impressive individual, and we just it was great to have her here. And, uh, you're straight from a commander, the 55th wing is no small thing, and we're really grateful to have her here at the meeting as well as you. So thank you uh, for that. No problem. I'll absolutely convey that to her, so thank you. I don't have a question, but I'm glad to hear that things are moving along on the flight line because I am anxiously awaiting those planes returning. I miss them flying over my house, believe it or not. I can't believe I'm saying that, but I miss that. So looking forward to that. Uh, that's great. Thank you, ma'am. <laughs> right, well, thank you for your time, everyone. Appreciate it. Thank you, Thank you, Colonel. All right, moving on to item C under Section 2 Communications, our presentation for this evening. Uh, we'll welcome up our uh, middle school one-to-one -one program.
turn it over to Ms. Siri to do some introductions for us. All right. Good evening, Board of Education. Um, tonight, we are lucky um, to have our three middle school principals here. And as you know, we um, implemented devices for all of our students uh, this past school year. And they're going to share with you um, the experience out of year one. Um, with that one-to-one -one program. So I have Tim Johnson from Papillion Middle School, Jen Carson from La Vista Middle School, and Troy Jaracek from Liberty. All right, good evening. We're gonna talk about the device impact of the middle schools and also some of the technology resources that have come along with it that have enhanced instruction. And I think the, the big thing you know, to take away is first a, a quote from one of our teachers. That's who we wanted to reach out to first was, that's where the impact happens is in the classroom. And so just a quote from one of our teachers here at Papillion Middle School in math. And I think the thing that our staff has, has shared is um, they've been able to move um, from just using technology um, to learning through technology and en enhancing instructions for all students. Before it was through a lab cart, you know, waiting on reserving those things. And so this year, it's, everybody's had the same access, um, no matter what class or content they're in. And so all teachers have been able to um, enhance instruction through having the uh, access to technology. Uh, just a couple of items for overview. Uh, some of the big impacts that we've seen, and then we'll give you some specific examples. Uh, it has been huge with our student absences that these last couple of years have brought to us. It's been huge that our kids have had access to education at home, um, especially some of our students that maybe receive some special services. Now they can Zoom and receive those services through our special education teachers, but also students just being able to make up work during those absences. It used to be a little bit difficult for teachers to gather items, then we would set it in the office and parents would have to come pick it up. But in the midst of them having to come pick it up, they have sick kids at home and it just wasn't always convenient. So it's very easy now that we have everything online. Kids can access things when they are gone. They can turn things in when they're gone. They can take assessments when they're gone. Um, there's been a lot of that communication between home and school that didn't exist prior to being one-to-one. -one. Obviously, it also saves on printing and rebinding. Uh, printing has gone down tremendously in our building. We keep tabs on that. Once a month, we get a report on it. Stu our teachers just don't need to print as much. We do provide print for any students that request it. But for the most part, they prefer to have it digital. And then rebinding of books, we've gone to pretty much a set of books in the classroom versus a, a book for each student to take home. Again, if they want one, they can definitely have that, that one in their hands. Um, but otherwise, they're not getting that wear and tear. So we're not having to replace as many textbooks, rebind them, replace them. It's been, been cost-saving for us as well. That instant feedback and access, it's feedback both directions. So now it's feedback from the teacher to the student. Student can respond to the teacher. There's that back and forth communication. So they're getting feedback on their academics. Uh, lighter backpacks for sure, fewer textbooks. Um, if you've ever picked up a middle school student's backpack, whoa. I don't know how we're not sending um, much stronger kids up to the high school that are built for athletics. Um, but their backpacks are heavy, and so it's really taken a load off of them. Um, they just have everything at their hands with their devices. The email access to staff while at school and home, um, I put it as learning email etiquette. Uh, we call it netiquette with our kids. Um, I'm shocked of how many kids do not know what e email etiquette is, so we've been teaching that to them so they get practice with that formal writing. Um, we still have kids that are putting the whole email in the topic of the email. Um, so we're working on that, but it is an opportunity for us to practice that written communication between um, teachers and students and parents and so forth. Equitable, uh, equitable access for sure. Now all of our kids have access to the devices. Uh, prior, we were utilizing some student phones just because we needed some additional devices. Now everybody has one in their hands, so it's not a have and have not. Everybody has the same access. And then to have that multiple modalities of learning, our students that need something read aloud, it's always at their fingertips. Students that need a visual, it's always at their fingertips. Students that need something to touch, to feel, everything is at their fingertips now, and we can provide all of those different modes of learning. Um, the last piece that isn't up here that we really uh, found was a big impact is all of our map testing and state testing. Uh, we used to have to pass around the carts, as Mr. Johnson was saying, and it would take a lot of instructional time, a lot of shifting, a lot of disruptions to the learning environment. And now we can knock those out all at the same time, especially with our bandwidth. Um, we can all do it at the same time in the building because everybody has their device and it's less disruptions to the, the number of days that we have disruptions in the classrooms. So it's been a huge, huge help to us at the middle level. Thank you. 
Um, again, we want to hit on the classroom teachers, and I think it, it doesn't go lost on us of, of how much the work the staff have done to prepare themselves uh, for this um, in the classrooms. It took a lot of professional development time um, to get ahead of the curve so that they could prepare, prepare their lessons and instructions to meet the needs having this device in the classroom. But we also wanted, I uh, reached out to several teachers just to say, how has this impacted your classroom? So um, the first one that actually got back to me was Mr. Conrad and Band. Um, and he's one of our tech leaders in our building, and he's really taken this on um, to reach students. He did some escape rooms um, in the classroom to, that they could do at home or in class to try to get uh, creative that way. Um, they can record sounds, you know, record their instruments, record their playing tests on those things for maybe those that are a little more anxious. Instead of doing it one-on-one -on -one with somebody or in the front of the class, they can record it at home and listen to it back themselves, um, which is really important for a middle school uh, a band student. I mean, if you've been in the beginning of band in middle school, it's important that they hear themselves because uh, Mr. Conrad does a great job at the beginning of the year and we're there at the end of the year and, and the work that he does there. So that feedback that he's able to hear and the students are able to hear throughout the year and they can kind of log that to show how much they've improved over the year. Um, the other part that I think that I appreciated him sharing was um, it allows for teachers who are going to be gone to set up um, documents in Google Classroom so that when they are gone, it makes life of a sub a lot easier. They come into the classroom, they open up their Google Classroom, and the lesson for the day is there. They can video themselves from the day before, you know, recording their lesson so they're really not missing out on a whole lot. And like, again, it's saved on subs. Instead of, you know, them not knowing what's going on, they can say, log into Google Classroom, the instruction's there. Right when they're ready to go, the documents are ready for them right when they get um, in the classroom. So that's really helped. Um, with, with subs and, and teachers being gone as well. Um, in the math classroom, um, the biggest thing is for all students, you know, good teaching is still good teaching, uh, but this is really enhanced instruction. Um, before we, like Dr. Carson said, we've relied on, you know, lab, lab, tar, lab carts or their own devices. Um, Google Classroom is now with all students. Um, it's really helped with formative feedbacks with Google Forms and those things. They can do some, some formative checks, some entry tickets, some exit tickets online as they come and go. Instead of having to collect those and, and, and sort through those at the end of the period, they can just do it and it'll scale them and rate them at the end of the class so the teachers know right where they are. Um, and then access to textbook information. I put an example here of just a, you know, a cutout from one of the textbooks. And I think it's good for students and staff, but it's also good for parents at home. Uh, they can see not just what the students are learning, but how they're learning, not just through the textbook, but also through the YouTube or videos that, that staff are creating. So they can't just, instead of just seeing the homework and good job today, it's, you know, what did you learn and how did you learn it? Because I know parents want to sit at the dinner table and, and learn how the students are learning so they can have those conversations with them. And just as an example for students that are gone or even in class, parents can keep track of what's going on in the classrooms on a weekly basis, the learning, the examples, the instruction, it's all there and it's logged. So if they're gone for a week, you know, family vacation, it's all there, you know, ahead of time, year to year. And when they come back, they know what they've been missing out on and can get caught up on. In media, um, Ms. Siski is one of our tech leaders in our building as well. Um, she just used it to in instantly assess students' understanding. Uh, the Google Forms have been great, so they can go through the lesson, the reading, you know, the understanding, and then rate where they're at. So she knows where her class is at, you know, within the first five minutes of from the, the previous lesson. How did you feel about yesterday? Good. Do we need some more instruction? Or are you ready to go so that we can move on and help differentiate instruction for uh, different groupings? Um, again, the absentee thing, if, if staff are gone or students are gone, she records her lessons um, and is able to do a flipped classroom that way, not just for students, but also for parents as well, um, to know what their kids are learning in class. Uh, finally, from media, uh, the individualized learning is really, really important. Um, on the Google Forms and the Google Classroom, she can give individual feedback as she's going through an assignment. She can rate it on the rubric that she has. The students can see the rubric as they are completing the assignment so that there's no misnomer of what they need to be doing. The expectations are clear and concise and visual for students. If it's a reading, it can be read aloud to them. So just that accessibility uh, for all students and then that in instant feedback instead of having to wait to pass them back out. As they grade them, they get the feedback right away. All right, and lastly, uh, from an English, English classroom, um, as they're reading Clay Marble this year, uh, instead of doing group work on a piece of paper or on a whiteboard, they have a Google form where they can all sh share what they've read or what their thoughts and takeaways are. And she, uh, Ms. Wiki was the one that submitted this one, um, can see where they're at in the learning themselves. Uh, with the group discussions, when they're done, they can do a self-assessment. Hey, how well did you understand this? What were the main takeaways? And then uh, for some of their individual uh, novels, the book Bento Project, and I'll show an example of it here. 
uh, just a visual way to show what they took away from the book. Um, different pictures talk about the different theme, the setting, the turning point, key characters, and different visualizing uh, visuals to represent what they learned. So different ways, you know, creatively, visually, audio, and um, through different projects, they're able to, to, to show what they've learned. And our kids are always learning. Um, when they're not learning from technology, they're learning how to get around technology and communicate with their friends. So there's um, a lot of times where we're working to try to stay ahead of the kids on, hey, there's games on these computers. I'd rather maybe do that than this. And it's always my favorite when I'm at an ESU workshop teachers can monitor from the ESU and send a message to the kid say, hey, get back on track or get on the right website, you know, so that the Securely software has really helped to minimize um, that situation and tailor that for individual kids versus blanketing all kids. The filters cover the blankets for all that. Kids are very social. Um, they're constantly snapping, communicating, and now they're learning how to use their devices because they have them out on how to communicate within a classroom. So it's good that they're learning the collaboration. We always want to keep steering them back to the use of that. And then just part of learning is taking responsibility and being prepared. I have to have my phone charged. I, I, they can have their phones charged, but they forget to charge their computers. So we're working with them to build that responsibility, just like we do with a lot of things. Um, kind of next steps with those challenges, we're excited to see how the district's professional credits will continue to evolve and expand to include a variety of topics. Because just like our kids are at different points with technology, so are our teachers. And so it's really neat to see how that's differentiated to meet the needs of our teachers as they use that professional credit time and learn from one another most of the time. So a great big thank you to the tech department helping us figure out how to support all these, how to invoice. Um, that has just been amazing. The turnaround time um, is very limited for the amount of time a kid is without a device. We have loaners that we can provide them. Um, they're just giving us constant feedback to build our capacity as adults. One of my favorite tech um, help desk tickets was a kid did, a seventh grader requested to get his computer detailed because it was getting a little bit messy. And their response was classic on how they are also helping teach kids responsibility of maybe taking care of their own computer. So it was really fun to see all, all that coming together and, and giving them a few more years as they navigate with this technology now what they're going to be like as seniors using this equipment to learn. Questions? Any considerations for you all? I have a couple questions. Um, you mentioned equitable access because now every student has one of these devices. But do all of our students have Internet access at home, or do we still see some gaps there with some students not having that availability? Yeah, we do see some gaps with that. It's one of the questions we ask at the start of the school year. Our teachers do a survey with all of our kids, especially on the teaming model, who has access at home and who does not, so that if they are home or whether it's homework related, whatever it may be, um, there's different ways that we can get them access. And if not, then we provide alternative ways to make sure that they have the same access to the materials that they need. So there is still a gap there. Um, I think vast majority of our families have access, but definitely not all. And then often our teachers are working with kids before school um, when they arrive by 730. Oh, I think all three of our buildings also have the foundation homework club, which can be available to kids throughout the week. You mentioned, mentioned a little bit about damage. Have you seen very much of that or is it really pretty minimal for the most part? Because it would seem to me that they'd want to take really good care of this for the most part, but they're kids, right? So. I believe the realization is really starting to settle in with those kids knowing that they're keeping their devices and their device is their device next year. So they've taken that ownership that if I take better care of it, mom and dad doesn't get upset with me, I'm not having to work for it, but just also I want my equipment to work good next year as well. There's been great communication on that as well. So our tech department, when we put in a help desk ticket, um, depending on what the damage is, they'll ask, was this purposeful? Was it an accident? Um, really trying to take each individual situation into consideration because accidents happen. Um, so the protection plan and all of those things that we have in place do help with that because sometimes things fall and they drop them. Um, but it's been really nice to have that communication, the open communication. Is it something that was accidental or are kids 
um, just being less responsible with them. So we'll work through those on an individual basis. I think one of the things that that speaks to is, you know, so many of us are still working from home because companies have found that that's an effective way for people to, to manage their job. But companies have that same thing. How, you know, damaged equipment, how did you damage it? What happened? Were you careless or was it a, truly an accident? Those kinds of things. So it's good for them to learn that responsibility of that piece of equipment that's going to be with them for some time. So thank you for answering my questions. I appreciate it. And on the uh, taking them year to year, do they, does that even go into the high school or once they're, yep, so they have Yep, so them. all students keep their devices except for seniors, and then the senior devices will be re-imaged and then prepared for our seventh graders <clears throat> coming in in the fall. Gotcha. Can't imagine a senior, uh, after all those years of being in the hands of uh, that age group, <laughs> the, uh, how much work would have to be done to re-image them and get them in the hands, but I mean, that's what, five, six years anyway, so I know we have our uh, usual turnover of those machines, but you're speaking of uh, you know, the tech staff and Lucas and team, we know are great, but with all the machines, how has the... Um, how has the support been in handling like those help disc tickets that are created or do they have the staff that they can get to them in a timely manner with all the machines out there? I don't want to speak for Lucas, but the, we have two staff that are in our building. We've kind of had a rotation of two staff that go between our three buildings. So they're at least twice a week in our building and work with our media staff in there to get those computers in and out pretty quickly. We've got a couple owners uh, that we get in and out, but they've been awesome. I think they've worn out this bridge, uh, which has been a great investment because they've used it uh, of getting devices back and forth really quickly, at least in our building. And I, I think we've said the same in all, across all three buildings. But even on the device itself, the, the case that we have right now is really sturdy and good. We've allowed kids to kind of put stickers on them so they can, you know, they're, they're individualized. They're their own. It's amazing. Their phones last a whole year, you know, but sometimes their textbooks would just be, you know, beaten up. This is theirs. They know they're going to have it. And so they've taken ownership. You know, most kids have taken ownership of it. No, they're going to have it. And it's been uh, pretty positive on that. So, gotcha. And one last question with all the, um, I mean, the, the positives that are from it after one full year, what any learnings of what we should be looking to do differently in, in year two on the one to one? I think just transition from elementary, knowing what they're going to be coming up with every year. You know, our seventh graders to eighth graders, they're going to know Google Classroom and everything down, making sure our sixth to seventh it has the skills that they need. Um, our staff are growing every year trying to get new ideas to keep things fresh and, and, and those things. Um, but I think the monitoring the securely software has been really, really impo impactful of, you know, when students know that, you know, teachers can keep an eye on them in that way, that's really avoided a lot of those just tough conversations because we all have our phones and we like to scroll and do that stuff. It's easy. It's mindless. It kind of keeps our mind off of work. But if they don't have access to that and they know I need to get to work, there's no time like in that classroom. So I think just making sure that transition every year, of these are the expectations. Um, when we're in class is what we should be doing and just setting that at the beginning of the year. And I think that also circles back to how do we continue the professional development of teachers, you know, getting it launched and started as phase one, um, really how do we start to teach with that instructional vision of how to engage kids versus what we had as a mindset before to what it can be and how kids best respond to that. So I, I see that a continual process for the next several years. I would say as well, if there's something that we can do, keep continuing to encourage kids with coding. Our kids are coding on their devices right in front of us. There's times I'll pull up a screen of a student and just the other day, half his screen was the actual website. The other half, he was literally recoding the website in front of me. So the more we can push that, our kids are doing it anyway, and they're finding out how to do it on their own just by playing around with it. The more that we can encourage that, it, it continues to grow them in that area as well. Gotcha. Appreciate it. I don't really have a question. I just wanted to say thank you, uh, you know, for everything. Whoops, as I hit that. Uh, being the next step in, in, uh, from high school to college and seeing how much technology is, we're seeing it so much to have them start at middle school so that by the time they reach the college level, you can tell who has had a chance to work with the technology because that's, I mean, that's the way most of our classes are going to. Um, you know, I was watching some of the things you're talking about, and, you know, and we're, and I'm, I'm at UNO, and so I, I can't speak for all the universities, but I, I'm, fairly certain the Nebraska system, all the schools are using a lot of technology, so I, I can't imagine most colleges aren't. So the fact that we're starting them at seventh grade and hopefully even earlier, like you all are saying, and, um, it's great to see that. So appreciate everything, all the hard work uh, that you all are doing and all your teachers are doing. Uh, I would just like to add thank you for the presentation. 
Um, it has been a learning curve. Our teachers have really taken it on as a challenge, and they've done an outstanding job. Whenever you implement a large um, change, that's always hard because um, you're trying to make sure that it's impactful and useful and positive uh, while continuing to do all of the other pieces of your job. So, so it can often be taxing at times, but they've really taken it on. And the kids, of course, it's the world they live in. So um, it's, it's nice to see that. And I think each year we'll see a little bit more growth. You know, um, technology is no longer an event in our schools. It's part of their day-to-day -day instrument of tools to use to demonstrate their learning as students. And teachers, it's a different way to engage kids with instruction. Uh, we'll continue to watch the data and see the changes. I know writing, we've seen increase significantly since we've put devices in their hands. Uh, I would, this is a blanket statement, but kids seem to be more willing to type uh, than physically write. Uh, so that's all good things because it's the skill and the engagement. So those are all positive aspects. And then the last piece I just want to add is like the three middle school principals, I'd also like to shout out to the tech team. They're very service oriented and we've added a lot of devices in this district in a short period of time. And Tim's not joking when uh, I see Tim Serretta or or Lucas Bingham run across the bridge on 84th Street um, because they realize that uh, students need access to those devices and getting them back up and running or getting um, a tentative one in their hands is super important. So um, everybody's really done a great job considering one year down and uh, it feels pretty smooth. I probably just jinxed us, but uh, we did make the decision we're going to leave them in the kids' hands over the summer. Um, districts that were one-to-one -one prior to us uh, did that due to COVID when we pushed out in March. They didn't collect them. They had really positive feedback to say from it, and so we've decided to stay with that model. Um, and then that also continues to, to keep access to kids to our library and other things in the summer. So thank you guys for the time. Thank you all. All right, that concludes item C under section two communications. Uh, moving on to item D, uh, our public comment on items not on tonight's agenda. Again, uh, for those in attendance and those watching on YouTube, uh, total comment period for this section of public comment on items not on tonight's agenda so not exceed 30 minutes unless the majority of the vote, vote of the board approves extending allocated time. Uh, individuals are limited to three minutes uh, time. Ms. Perenko has her timer. Uh, I'll have a secondary backup again. The first beep is at 2 minutes and 15 seconds with the uh, final beeps at 3 minutes. Again, when I call you up to the uh, microphone, uh, please state your name and address for the record. Uh, first up this evening for public comment on items not on tonight's agenda, uh, Ms. Megan Elkins. Welcome. Hi. Megan Elkins, 1212 Buckboard Boulevard. Uh, I would just like to start off by saying how elated I am in Brittany Holt Meyer's huge win in the PLS CS School Board primary. What once some referred to as the minority have truly been shown who the minority are. I can't wait to vote for Brittany Holt Meyer and Patricia Conway Boyd come November. Next, this is something personal, but obviously needs to be said. This is for the coward, and I say coward because they weren't brave enough to sign their work, who felt compelled to falsify a five-page letter of why people should not vote for Brittany Holtmeyer. The letter was about as smartly written as the idea of leaving them on doors with Miss Holtmeyer's sign in their yard. The school board desperately needs new blood and new ideas. Perhaps term limits should be something to consider in the future. Lastly, this board has put our children through hell over the last two years. The board chose to only listen to one side of the story Sorry. when it came to masks. This board spat in the face of the Constitution, parents, and on the oath they took when accepting those positions. Us moms are not done. We are just beginning. So I sit here with a big smile on my face as a mama bear showing her fangs and growling a little bit back in the board's faces. 
No, we have not forgotten, and no, we have not forgiven. We are all moms on a mission. We are coming for your jobs one by one. We will not be deterred in any way. These are our children, not yours. Never again will we be told how to raise them. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, next up for public comment on items not on tonight's agenda, uh, Ms. Lowen Eby. Hello, I'm Lowen Eby, and I write, reside at 1401 Edgewater Circle, Papillion 68046. My comments are related to what Mr. Lotus said in the Omaha World Herald article after the primary elections and the minimal preparation by three board members at the May 9th board meeting. In the Omaha World Herald article, Mr. Lotus said the three incumbents finished second, third, and fourth with minimal campaigning. He said voters supported what the board has done the past few years. Here's why I did not vote for the incumbents. The incumbents did nothing while Dr. Rickley violated policy 1409 fundraising. The incumbents did nothing while Dr. Rickley violated policy 6402 use of materials and policy 6405 controversial issues, AKA in Ms. Witt's words, the racism statement concern. This is related to the book, Something Happened in Our Town. The incumbents did nothing while Dr. Wrigley discriminated against students' deeply held religious beliefs and denied notarized affidavits. The word minimal describes the effort put forth by Ms. Fisher, Ms. Witt, and Mr. Madler during the discussion item, Purchase Agreement for Future Elementary School Site. After Mr. Richard's presentation, Ms. Fisher did not seem to know where the plat of land was. The question can be answered by typing in the address on your phone and taking a drive, which is what I did. The plot of land is on Lincoln Road, just past 96th Street and past the access apartments. Ms. Witt asked questions about current and projected enrollments in elementary schools. The answer can be found on slides 19 and 20 of the RSP and Associates Enrollment Study the district paid 19500 for. Mr. Madler asked for if the purchase of land was from the last bond go-around. The answer to his question was on the first slide of Mr. Richard's presentation, and it can be found on the bond issue page on the district website. I would like to close by congratulating Ms. Brittany Holtmeyer for receiving the most votes in the primary elections. Her hard work and maximum campaigning paid off. Ms. Holtmeyer, your efforts remind me of this year's Kentucky Derby winner, Rich, Rich Strike. Rich Strike came out of nowhere and won the race and won the hearts of the world. You have won the hearts of the district. I know when you get elected to the board, you will represent us and follow the rule of law. I'm looking forward to your service. Thank you for the opportunity to speak this evening. Thank you. Next up for public comment on items not on tonight's agenda, uh, Ms. Brittany Holtmeyer. Welcome. Hi. Uh, Brittany Holtmeyer, 2007 Richwood Drive. Um, in the May 13th Papillion Times, the following quote was given in regards to the primary election results. Witt has said she was not surprised by Holtmeyer's strong showing, complimenting her hard campaigning. The incumbent noted that most beginners do not fully understand um, involved with becoming a board member. Anybody who comes on the board will be welcome, she said. They will be brought up to speed and eventually understand the work. Ms. Witt, from your bio you state, my career over 49 years has been in education, not as a teacher, but in supportive and administration roles, administrative roles. Ms. Witt, with all due respect, I do not need you or any of the current board members' advice to fully understand what is involved to becoming a board member. You see, I will not waste taxpayers' dollars by attending indoctrinational retreats and workshops. What the board needs is common sense. It needs common sense. It needs you to require you to follow by the policies the board sets in place. 
obey laws, grown adults to hold super account, superintendent accountable, the guts to have a discussion, and it actually attend subcommittees and come back with an update. It takes transparency with staff, students, and the community. We need board members to not give in to the indoctrination, not to be a yes man, not to give in to the pressure from other members. I will have the guts to stand up for what I believe in and continue being a voice to those who trust and believe in me. Yes, I will make the board and superintendent aware that we have a serious mental health crisis going on in the district. We have witnessed loss of learning and we need to get back our teachers' love of teaching and be a support to them always and listen. And a little advice that I give to you is, you took an oath when you were elected as a Papillion La Vista school board member and you need to uphold it. Thank you. Thank you. I see no further requests for public comment on items not on tonight's agenda. We will move on to item E. Uh, under section two communications, our superintendent's report. Thank you very much, Mr. Lotus, members of the board. Again, for our community members that are here, welcome. Thank you for being here this evening. Uh, it's an exciting time. This is our last week of school. All of our schools are closed. Uh, as of Wednesday afternoon for a well-deserved summer break. So hope everybody has an opportunity to recharge the batteries and spend some time with family and loved ones and come back fresh and ready to go in August. Uh, all offices are closed uh, Memorial Day in observance of the holiday. Uh, also wanted to share with the board, we're continuing our facility listening sessions, which we have shared with the board. We've, in fact, we've concluded our last one today at Terra Heights Elementary. Uh, so for our community members who may be watching or in attendance, we are looking at potential renovation projects uh, at each of our 21 buildings and potential uh, new buildings to accommodate the district growth that was outlined in the RSP study. So we will be in the process of summarizing that data and sharing it with the board and the community uh, once all that data has been aggregated. Uh, we did have an announcement, but also, by the way, there's a very special person that's with us this evening, and I wanted to make sure and get this, uh, get this in before the board takes action. This is pending board approval, but um, we had a number of administrative moves over the last several months, and uh, hopefully this is the last administrative move that we have to make, Dr. Settles. I know you've been very busy with your team doing interviews and other such things. Um, Megan Schumacher, who's currently a sixth grade teacher at La Vista West Elementary, uh, recently interviewed for the assistant principal position at Carriage Hill. Uh, that position was vacated by Kristen Nelson. She'll be returning uh, to a, a neighboring district. And uh, the pool was very deep. The pool was very deep. And Ms. Schumacher is not only an outstanding sixth grade teacher, but she's also a distinguished alum from our leadership, our PLCS uh, leadership cohort. Uh, I believe Megan's in back with family members. Uh, Megan, if you wouldn't mind standing and being recognized by your Board of Education. We know you'll do great things at Carriage Hill with Mr. Hively, and uh, thanks for being here, Megan. A uh, few other uh, celebrations that we had. Uh, first off, we know Molly Grasso, who's drama, fine arts teacher at Papillion La Vista High School. Uh, many of us had the opportunity to see SpongeBob uh, when they did their production uh, several weeks ago. Uh, SpongeBob the Musical did receive the outstanding musical as designated by the Omaha Performing Arts Council, uh, and they only give a very few of those awards every single year. So a special shout out to Molly and her, uh, her team and her students. Also found out our own Dr. Steele, who I don't believe is in attendance this evening, is, is he's hiding in the back. He, he knew that I might call him out. Evening, Dr. Steele. I love the tie, by the way. Uh, Dr. Steele was recently named an uncle. Uh, that is an acronym. Uh, Dr. Steele holds a degree from the University of Nebraska Kearney, and UNCLE stands for the University of Nebraska Kearney Leadership and Education Award. It's a very prestigious award. I believe we've had at least two other district administrators, former Superintendent Dr. Harlan Metschke, as well as former uh, Assistant Superintendent Dr. Renee Hyde, I believe, both received this award. You have to be an alum, of course, from UNK to receive this award. But congratulations, Dr. Steele. We're very proud of your efforts. And Another, this is on the district website, and uh, I think South has pushed out this communication, but it's one I'm very proud of, particularly with uh, Colonel Cooley just giving his report. Uh, Papillion La Vista South was recently designated a Purple Star School. This is a new law in the state of Nebraska. Other states had it prior. Um, basically, it's meant to recognize school buildings that are exceptionally friendly to military families and their dependents, which is something very near and dear to this board with 
board members who have served our, our great country. Uh, a few of the criteria for the, the Purple Star designation are um, you have to have a designated military liaison. You have to have a website dedicated to maintaining uh, the standards for the Purple Heart designation. And I think probably the single most powerful piece of the designation is you have to have a transition program run by students. So the way that looks is as a new military family moves in, particularly if they have dependents, it's the students, not our staff, the students that are meeting with those kids and showing them here's where our lockers are, here's how the schedule works, here's what you need to get done if you're going to be successful in Papillion La Vista Community Schools. And I think that's really powerful that our students are taking a leadership role. So we're one of a handful of Class A's. In fact, I think there's only three Class A's in the state of Nebraska, Kearney, Bellevue, and us, uh, that have received this designation. So we're very proud. And for those 9% of our students that are military dependents, uh, we, we are here to serve you. And finally, I wanted to offer congratulations to our six Board of Ed candidates. We started with nine. We're down to six. Some of them are here this evening, uh, including three incumbents and three non-incumbents, and just want to uh, wish them the best of luck as the general election fast approaches in November. And with that, Mr. Lotus, I'd conclude my superintendent comments. Thank you, Dr. Rickley. Moving on to item F under Section 2 Communications, uh, board comments for this evening. The only thing I was able to get to, which was uh, pride and joy for me, was my grandson was a sixth grade band student, and the monarch side of the population did their concert on May 12th. And uh, I, I know all the parents who were there are proud of their kids, but my son, grandson's section was the best. <laughs> Just, yeah. Of course it was. Well, um, before I was no longer able to attend any events, um, I was able to attend the years of service in the retirement uh, event, and that to me is always a highlight to see the number of years of service so many of our uh, staff have given to this district and to see the smiling faces on their families and, and everything. That's just, just a real highlight in how many people, as they were retiring, how many years they've given the district as well. So um, I really enjoyed that. Sorry I had to miss the rest of the events, but it was nice to be able to be there for that one because that's a really, a really telling event. It's just nice to see all of those individuals be recognized for the time they've given to this district, to the community, to the parents, to the students, and to their peers. So... Very nice event. Yeah, I hated that I had to miss everything, but um, I appreciate you all keeping me apprised of it. Um, I, I wanted to get a quick chance to thank everybody, all the staff, everybody for all the hard work. Um, just a couple more days, as you said. I know I've got one at home. She's counting, I think, down to the hours now, so um, she's ready to be done. Definitely needs to recharge the batteries, but uh, we drove by, I think it was G. Stanley Hall, and on their board, I think it, all it said was, you got this. So um, I thought that was apropos for this week. You just got a couple more days, but uh, thank everybody for doing that. On a personal note, since we had all the track recognitions, uh, my son helps coach uh, track, uh, Nick, um, and I had to give a little shout-out. He uh, won the uh, Papillion Half Marathon on Saturday. So, um, yeah, he's, he was pretty excited. We were pretty excited for him. Again, I had to miss that too, but my wife was there cheering him on. So I guess he missed the uh, overall record by three seconds, so he was a little irritated by that. But otherwise, I had to give a little shout-out to him. But the good news is, Mr. Bailey, I believe the aviation team that you took to Columbus, Ohio, had a top 10 national finish. Am I, am I wrong? You are correct. Uh, well, congratulations to you and the UNO aviation team. I also want to just thank all the, the staff uh, and teachers for, you know, uh, years' worth of hard work. Again, I mean, there's a lot thrown at them this year. Uh, I hope that everyone can get some time to recharge over the summer. Uh, spend some time doing doing what they like doing uh, and hopefully come back in August uh, ready to go again. Um, and I also did go to Gretna facilities with Dr. Rickley, uh, Mr. Richards, and, and Dr. Foya, just looking at some of their newer facilities um, as we are, again, rethinking uh, options in the future, uh, specifically with the, the baseball and the, and the softball fields. And I thought that was a great tour that... Uh, we got just to see what some options are out there for for uh, what people are doing for the newer fields. And I also went to the retirement and the award, uh, years of recognition service, and it was great. Uh, got a lot of teary eyes in the room as they were showing some of those slideshows. 
uh, but it was a great, um, great event that the team put on here and uh, gave. Uh, you could tell all the, the the staff for the both the award, or the years of service awards, and the retirement all all appreciated it. And some of them brought their families as well, which was great to see. You know, like everybody else, you know, I attended as many uh, end of year events as as I possibly could. Um, Looking forward to my, my last event uh, as, a, as a proud parent uh, on Wednesday, sixth grade graduation uh, for Ashbury. Uh, very small class, a little bigger than last year's uh, initial class of, uh, of a, a handful of sixth graders, but uh, looking forward to that on, on Wednesday. Uh, again, big, big thanks to uh, all the spring uh, activities and coaches and, and all the hard work that, that goes into that and, and to see uh, all the how well they do with social media to, to keep uh, those of us uh, in the public you know aware of just good accomplishments and showing our students success but also how much fun they're having uh, in participating in their high school activities or, or athletics uh, it's just it's just fun to scroll through Facebook or Twitter or Instagram or whatever and just see you know the, the coaches or or a assistant coach or somebody taking control and, and constantly use, utilizing the technology that we have to uh, kind of keep us updated. It was fun to watch kind of the live updates from state track last week uh, as things uh, were unraveling and uh, how exciting that event is. Uh, didn't get out there this year. So, again, thanks for a successful uh, activities from both Monarchs and Titans. And uh, one last thing, uh, Mr. Richards, that uh, Monarch scoreboard is pretty sharp. Pretty nice. I uh, happened to finally get a drive down that direction yesterday and went, oh, it's up. And then I saw the one up uh, on the uh, – uh, western side of the building as well for the teams to be able to to see um it's a it's a pretty pretty sharp uh complex now so just wanted to give you a, a good good shout out there for something really cool so any other board comments for this evening all right seeing none we'll move on to item g our committee reports uh, building grounds and finance uh we have not met Thank you, Dr. Foya. Uh, Human Resources and Student Services. We had a meeting this evening. Uh, we learned about uh, the negotiations that have begun for the pairs and the clerical staff, and we will follow up with that at a very short future meeting. Thank you, Ms. Witt. And Curriculum and Americanism. We uh, did have a meeting last week. I appreciate the flexibility to do that via Zoom. And um, we had several items we discussed, but they will all be on future board agendas for both discussion and then action. Thank you, Ms. Fisher. All right, well, that concludes item or section two communications. Moving on to section three, our action items for this evening. Uh, item A, action by consent. To approve. I have a motion by Ms. Fisher and a second by Dr. Tafoya. Uh, roll call, please. Yes. 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 Uh, item B, our board meeting minutes of May 9th, 2022. To appro approve the board meeting minutes of May 9th, 2022. I have a motion by Mr. Madler and a second by Mr. Bailey. Uh, roll call, please. Yes. 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 Thank you. All right, moving on to item C, the purchase and sale agreement with Granite Creek Development, LLC, for future elementary school site. I'll turn it over to Mr. Richards. Okay, well, thanks, Mr. Lotus. Good evening, everyone. Wanted to kind of cover some of the things that were asked at the last meeting a little bit and give you a little more information on this land, uh, possible purchase for the district. Uh, it sits about 12.127 acres, northwest section of 99th and Lincoln Road, which is uh, east of Liberty Middle School. Um, funding is from 2018 bonds. You know, in the materials that were put out during that bond campaign, we had $6 million allocated for land purchases during the bond campaign. For land acquisition, uh, $4.2 million of that has been spent. Um, this purchase will put it close to $5 million spent. 
So we'll still have a little bit there to help with some, you know, possible SID costs and those things down the line uh, that typically come with a, a purchase of this magnitude. Uh, RSP Associates enrollment analysis uh, shows over four, 600 more elementary students over the next five years. Uh, most of that growth will be north of Highway 370 um, and uh, south of Highway 370 in the Ashbury boundary area. Ashbury has the room for the growth. Prairie Queen does not. Just to give you an idea of where that growth comes from, um, is Prairie Queen is going to grow 332 students estimate-wise per uh, projections over that five-year period and then Ashbury's 309 uh, and that's sitting and it, it'll fill up Ashbury over those five years so that's why you know as we look at the next um, facility improvement campaign uh, the next piece of land we may want to be looking at three or four years from now would be probably in that Ashbury boundary area um, expected growth for individual buildings and we haven't covered this yet because we were processing that with our admin team and uh, cabinet um, can be now found on the website at pages 44 to 46. Um, on, you can do that. Just go to our website, plcs.org, about us, and then click future growth, and that whole study is on there. Uh, it's really good information for the community to, to kind of keep pay attention to and keep track of. Um, talked about that one. So 823 students in five years, Prairie Queen schedule four. We do have some empty portables on the on site from the previous cycle uh, before Ashbury is built uh, to take some of that extra students. Um, but eventually, as you can see, we'll need a new school in that area. Um, just for reference again, put up the map of the land and you can kind of see the top part of the screen is Lincoln Road uh, and then 99th Street is where that circular road is coming in at on the right side of the screen. You can kind of see where that'll attach to Lincoln Road and 99th Street there. So if you get a chance to drive by, you'll know exactly where that property is. Okay, and then building specific. Oh, yeah, I, I talked about that. But I think, you know, stressing that for all buildings and all, all staff and, and community out there to check your boundary area and those elementary, junior high, and high school areas with the growth projections that are seen there. Just the district stayed ahead of the growth fairly well, um, and we look good for the next five years other than the areas we're talking about tonight. Thank you, Mr. Richards. Uh, just a couple of points that occurred to me. Uh, one, uh, Brett mentioned that we do have two portables currently at Prairie Queen. <laughs> Uh, typically, portable can hold two classrooms, assuming an average class size of 24, 25. That gives you a little bit of slack, 100 students total. Um, but at some point, we're going to outpace uh, even the portable. So that's why this probably becomes pretty critical. Um, second thing to be mindful of is uh, if the board does decide to execute this and we do end up uh, building another elementary building, a 17th elementary building, we will need to do boundary adjustments. Of course, anytime you open a new building, you have to establish attendance zones. Uh, which is one of the more difficult things to do that we do as a district and as a board, but just something to be thinking about uh, on down the line. Any board, further board comments, questions? Yeah, just a comment on, uh, uh, you know, buying the land and potentially building another school. We would, this is just for the land, to build uh, another school, that would have to be part of a, bond future bond right where it would go out in front of the public and and uh, uh the public would get their say on that right yes correct yeah. thanks and i just i think um i talked to i think it was you about this because i had this question so we you know spend the money buy the land it doesn't necessarily mean we have to build a school there for some reason those projections don't come to fruition or they change or something like that we can we can possibly sell that land back and, and if we need to do that sort of thing. I don't, I, yeah. with this study, I don't think that's going to happen, but that is a. Uh, I think that's a, you know, and that's something to keep an eye on. You know, these studies are based on good times in America. And we, I don't think we've ever seen what's happening the last two years in America with COVID and how that and inflation and, and um, supply chain issues can affect the economy. Um, so, you know, that we'll keep an eye on that study every year. Um, and make sure that that stays accurate. If it doesn't, we adjust and, and try to 
you know, update that chart every year to make sure that we're keeping in front of it and know when we will need to build a school if it slows down. Rumsey Station was going to be uh, further west, and we did not care for that site. We brought it in to Eagle Hills because of population growth. We also had the same situation in the Fricky, uh, Fricky land. Uh, we had property in there, and uh, we ended up uh, selling that and building elsewhere. I think one of the challenges is that, <clears throat> you know, we have an opportunity to buy land now, and <clears throat> it gives us that chance if we need to build uh, in the future, but it also allows us to be able to sell the land in the future, too, if that turns out not to be the case. It's very difficult, though, to be in a urgent situation and hope that land will be available for you then. So this just gives us some leeway and some ability um, to have something available should that need arise based on the studies that we're seeing and what the anticipated growth is. So I'll make the motion to approve the attached agreement and resolution as presented for the selection of certain property in the Granite Creek subdivision and entering into a property purchase and sale agreement for such site with Granite Creek Development, LLC. I have a motion by Mr. Madler and a second by Dr. Tafoya. Uh, any other board comments, discussion related to this item? All right, and I see no public comment. Uh, Requests related to this item. I'll call for a roll, roll call, please. Yes. Dr. Foya? Yes. Ms. Fisher? Yes. Mr. Yes. Mr. Yes. Yes. Thank you. Moving on to our final item under Section 3 action items. Uh, item D, our ESU 3 driver's education contract for 2022-2023. Mr. Richards. Okay, thank you. Um, this is an annual routine business of the board uh, to work with ESU3 on providing driver education courses for our students as an opportunity uh, for them to be involved. It's what I think of many several years that it has an increase in price too, which is kind of good to hear. <laughs> uh, so uh, I would recommend that we go ahead and approve that contract with ESU3 and give our students and families opportunities for driver's education. Richard, do we have any idea how many of our students take um, advantage of this over um, the years? Do we, really do we know? Yeah, it's, it's a relatively small number. It's less than 100. In fact, I think it's under 50. Uh, and part of the reason is there are other competing programs out there. Uh, Safety Council offers one. Cornhusker Driving School offers one. The, the, the price is very competitive, but this by you approving this contract is not obligated Papillion La Vista Community Schools student to take this one. It's just a contract that we have. If somebody wants to go to Cornhusker Driving School, for example, they, they could absolutely do that. But it is a relatively small number every year. This is just providing another option to our students. Okay. Yeah. All right, well, then I make a motion to approve the 2022-2023 ESU uh, number three driver's education contract. I have a motion by Mr. Bailey and a second by Ms. Witt. Any further board comments related to this item? Seeing none and no public comment request regarding this item, I'll move for a roll call, please. Yes. 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 All right, that concludes Section 3 action items. Moving on to Section 4, our discussion and information items for this evening. Uh, one item A, uh, our policy uh, 5,000 students. Uh, I will turn that over to Dr. Settles. All right, and Dr. Steele and Dr. Myers are here to present. Um, as you know, they spend at least half of their time in student services every single day, um, split with human resources. So thanks for your work. 
take it, let you take it from here. Thank you. Good evening, members of the board. Again, I'm Trent Steele, and this is... Becky Myers. <laughs> Good evening. Uh, we're here for the uh, annual review of the 5000 policy series. Uh, it's going to be uh, up for the board's consideration at the next regularly scheduled uh, meeting of the board. Um, the updates this year have been marked up and have been reviewed by the Human Resources and Student Services Subcommittee of the board. Um, taken together, uh, the updates are mainly uh, procedural in nature and are aimed to ensure uh, compliance with uh, all relevant state and, and federal laws and, and especially new ones that have, that have been enacted. Uh, we would uh, yield to any questions that you may have uh, regarding these updates at this time. Based on my review, am I correct? Are, are these just all the proposed changes? Are the, they're all procedural? There's not actually any policy, specific policy change language? Am I missing some? Oh, sorry, 5601. Sorry, I did miss one. I thought I saw one in there, so I answered my own question. Sorry about that. <laughs> any other board comments, questions? Again, as uh, you continue your re review of the 5000 series, uh, if you have any further uh, comments, questions, suggestions, edits, uh, please send them to Dr. Myers and Dr. Steele for their consideration. All right. Thank you. They let you off back. They, they, they let you off the hook. <laughs> Easy tonight. All right. That concludes Section 4. Uh, discussion and information items for this evening. Moving on to section five, our future board calendar. Uh, unlike the last few meetings, we're down to uh, a fairly short future board calendar. Uh, Wednesday, as Dr. Rickley uh, stated earlier, Wednesday is a half a, half a day for all students. Uh, so May 25th, 2022, the official last day of school for the Papillion La Vista Community Schools. Uh, May 30th, uh, again, as noted, uh, Memorial Day, all of the offices in the district will be closed. And then next up will be June 13th, 2022, the next Board of Education meeting at 6 p.m. here at the central office. Uh, seeing no further business before the board, I will adjourn the Papillion La Vista Community Schools Board of Education meeting for May 23rd, 2022 at 7.07 p.m. Thank you all.